Okay, welcome. Can you hear me at the back? Yes? Brilliant. Fantastic. So there are a few folks just coming in, uh, but we're going to make a start because we've got, I hope, loads of questions uh, to get through later on. Uh, so you've come to hear about careers in sustainability, and uh, we've got an amazing panel for you to hear from uh, this evening. Uh, in terms of the, the event, it's being recorded, so when we come to questions, you know that you'll be uh, preserved uh, for time memoriam in terms of your great uh, insights and, and searching uh, questions. In terms of the format for tonight, so we're going to have some brief um, introduction from our panel members, just in terms of their, their journey, in terms of uh, sustainability in their careers. Often uh, we don't even know it's sustainability that our career is kind of going into, but so many of our jobs uh, are headed that way. It's such an important kind of mainstream aspect of, of the future, I guess, of our society and our planet. So sustainability, uh, you're in the right place, I think, if you come along tonight. So we'll hear for five minutes from each of our panel members. I'll introduce them as we go. Then we're going to open it out for questions from you. And I really want you, as the panel members talk, to listen to what they say, but reflect on, on the things which you've always wondered about in terms of how do you get a career in sustainability, its different forms, what are the top tips you want to hear about, what are the potential barriers but opportunities. And we're blessed in this university with having our uh, social responsibility and sustainability department uh, who um, are involved, obviously, in this event, but in so much across the university. And one of the things, hopefully, that will come out, if you ha aren't already aware of it, is just how much uh, opportunity there is to actually uh, get involved through the university in uh, sustainability, in, yes, making your CV look really good, but also in terms of living and breathing um, sustainability in the different disciplines and in terms of uh, collaboration with the community uh, in Edinburgh and all around the world. So, uh, I should have introduced myself. So, I'm a climate scientist based in geosciences. My name's Dave Ray, uh, and I teach a sustainability course in undergraduate. So, if any of you fancy doing that course, uh, then drop me an email, because uh, it'd be great to have more people on it. Right, so, now I'll introduce uh, a panel, one by one. So, our, our first panellist on my right is Stuart Brown. Stuart's a colleague in the university who's done, he's got an amazing career, he'll tell you a bit about that uh, in a minute. Uh, I've worked with Stuart uh, over the last few months as part of a group looking at this university in terms of how on earth we can become carbon neutral by 2040. That's the aim of the university. If we do it, we will be absolutely groundbreaking in terms of this massive institution becoming carbon neutral in line with where we need to be in terms of global climate change, but a, a huge undertaking, and people like Stuart have been fundamental in terms of mapping out how we could do that. Other really amazing things about Stuart, so Stuart trained as an engineer, worked with Rolls-Royce, uh, but had a key role in FlowWave, which is the university's uh, large centre, a uh, collaborative centre, looking at uh, uh, producing energy from, uh, from marine environments, so from waves and the oceans. So an amazing career already, Stuart, and, and please, over to you, tell us more. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, as Dave alluded, um, I suppose my career started quite some time ago. Um, I started off uh, as a mechanical engineer um, at what was then a polytechnic uh, university. Um, I did a mechanical engineer, first of the B.Eng. qualifications. Um, I was sponsored through the second half of that by Rolls-Royce, um, not meaning the Rolls-Royce cars, but Rolls-Royce aero engines. Uh, and from there I went into Rolls-Royce in a professional role, um, first in engineering, looking at jet engines in helicopters, um, designing parts of the, uh, the, the test, uh, the combustion chamber uh, within the helicopter jet engine. Uh, that is a very cutting edge uh, technology and an area to work if you're a mechanical engineer. It's very high temperatures, very high forces, very high stresses um, and so on. It's very challenging. Um, I was there for about four years. Um, I left and went to do uh, or, or, or go in search of other challenges and I went off and did a, a kind of round the world trip as a backpacker. It was quite popular at the time. Uh, I ended up working in Sydney for the Olympics Commission, or not the Commission but the Olympics bid. Um, amongst other things, I came back to the, the UK. Uh, you can probably tell from my accent I'm not originally from Scotland so I moved up to Scotland. 
um, that was a bit of a, a pleasure for me to come and be based uh, in Scotland and one of the reasons for that was uh, the EU. I couldn't go and work in the EU quite as freely uh, as it is now and, and I hope it doesn't come to pass that we leave. But um, I came to Edinburgh for all of those reasons. I ended up moving away from engineering. I moved into uh, backpacker travel and uh, tourism. Uh, that gave me a great opportunity to meet a lot of different people from different cultures and so on. Um, and that was an, as an entrepreneur. I'd started that business from scratch with a, a, an overdraft from the bank of 2,000 pounds. After eight years, uh, I sold that biz business on and moved into another area. And I exited, I think the entrepreneurial phrase for these days would be an exit. Um, I exited in 2005. Um, and I went off and had some more fun uh, traveling and enjoying myself and so on. But ultimately, um, I was felt a little bit um, kind of unchallenged. Uh, I came back. I wanted to come back into engineering. And I wanted to come back into an, in, an area of engineering that was, was young and developing. And I thought I had some skill sets that were relative um, or, or, or you know, would be valuable. So I did an MSc in Renewable Energy Engineering um, at Harriet Watt University. Uh, I'd previously done an MBA at Napier um, and a Diploma of Management Studies at uh, Kingston University. So every few years, every 10 years roughly, I'd added to my, uh, my skill set of qualifications to keep my hand in and develop. But I did this Masters in Renewable Energy, Renewable Energy Engineering. That led to a project with a company called Skur Energy in Glasgow. Uh, they are a technical uh, consultancy on renewables. That led uh, into then a role and a job within uh, SCUR, uh, where I was a due diligence uh, engineer. Um, so I worked mostly on offshore wind farm projects, mostly in Germany. Um, and if you're not sure what due diligence is, um, it's a process that you go through or a bank will go through this process when a developer is asking for money from the bank in order to develop a project. So there are three types of diligence. Legal due diligence, you'll probably be aware of, sort of thing you get when you buy a house or a property. But there's also technical due diligence and insurance due diligence. And the process is that the technical due diligence, the engineering due diligence, is key because if a project doesn't work technically, it doesn't matter how good the contracts are, it's not going to get funding from the bank. So the technical and engineering due diligence is key. Then you try and engineer out as much of the risk in a project. Then you go into the legal due diligence and contract out as much of the risk as you can. Whatever risk you can't get rid of, you try and insure. There's only so much appetite for insurance in the marketplace. And so the developer has to take that risk. And so my role working for the bank was also working in and alongside the developers of these projects to kind of get to grips with it um, and really to test it. And my role really was to try and pull this project apart in every which way I could. And if it survived that, it then carried on and went through and eventually got the money. So at this point, before I came into the university, um, I'd help the whole bundle of offshore wind farm projects get to financial close. And I'm happy to say that all of those are now built. At one point, there was 4.2 billion euro worth of projects on my desk, and that's 1.2 gigawatts installed now that I help get over the line financially. Um, that took me to Germany and traveling a lot to Germany and Denmark. Um, that didn't work for me very well. I had a family just started at that time, so I looked for a role closer to home. Um, I'm well, not born and based in Edinburgh, but certainly based in Edinburgh now. And the Flowwave um, project, which is a construction project in the, in the early stages, moving into, um, uh, into the construction operations, that was in wave and tidal energy, and that was just fantastic to get uh, another, another string to my bow, uh, but also still in clean ocean technology. We are very blessed in Scotland where we are because we are on the right side of the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. We have a huge resource of wind, wave, and tidal power. Um, and I believe that that is something we should harness and capture for the benefit of all. Um, that then leads into the, the role that was mentioned before with RELCO. The university has decided to go zero carbon, net zero carbon by 2040. It's easy to have an ambition. Then you need to work out how you can deliver on that ambition. And myself and colleagues within the RELCO team are working through that process of how we deliver that and what the options might be to achieve that in the lowest risk, best outcomes, lowest cost, et cetera, et cetera, way. So it's an optimization exercise of all the different engineering options and technical options. 
Um, that's where we are just now. It's probably a good time to cut it. That's brilliant. Thank you, thank you Stuart. I'm going to jump off this seat for a second. These are really uncomfortable. I don't know if the rest <laughs> of you are finding it, but it's just incredibly kind of, I don't know, I feel like I'm going to fall off any second. So if you see us teetering, you know why. Hopefully we can hold on for this session, but we might do stand up if you, if you feel the need to. So our next panel member is, is Kate, Kate Chambers. So Kate um, is a member of uh, a group really dear to my heart. You, you might have heard of them, the 2050 Climate Group. And they are a really active group, uh, obviously focused on climate change, but uh, Kate's the communications uh, director. They're really, um, they do loads of stuff here in Scotland, but also uh, send a delegation to the Conference of the Parties, this big meeting, climate change conference, towards the end of each uh, year. Uh, and uh, the last delegation, um, they, so, so Kate was saying, they got their rail travel paid for them by Virgin, which was great, so they travelled low carbon. Then they met the first minister there. She was really impressed, as so she's talked about that meeting quite a lot, just in terms of seeing uh, people from Scotland actually representing uh, views on climate change to a global audience. So it's an incredible um, work you do through the 2050 Climate Group. Kate also uh, works as a recycling advisor uh, for a, a company called Vegware Limited, uh, looking at plant-based food packaging. So really topical at the moment, given uh, one of the key sustainability issues. I think if you, talk, if you walked up to anyone on the street, certainly if they liked David Attenborough and said sustainability, they would go plastic packaging. And obviously that's something which at the moment is quite a focused um, issue for the governments and for industry to try and tackle and something which has really captured people's imaginations. But obviously your company's part of solving that. So thank you, Kate. Over to you. And I'll try this seat again. Great. Thanks very much for having me here tonight. Um, it's really exciting just first off to see how many people have come along to this. Um, it gives me hope that people really care about sustainability and even speaking to um, one of the students earlier tonight it seems like not everyone's from um, environmental backgrounds so that's really <coughs> encouraging as well that people are coming along from different subjects within the university and um, so yeah I'm here with a couple of hats on tonight um, I'm obviously part of the 2050 climate group which is a voluntary organization and um, it's completely oh, it's completely run by young people. I'll try and put this back on. Um, yeah, the group is run by young people, um, and it's just incredible to be part of something that has grown organically out of um, young people in Scotland's ambition to do something about climate change and to really be a voice um, for the future and to encourage the future leaders to do something about these issues that we're facing. So in the 2050 Climate Group, for anyone who doesn't know, um, our main focus is running the Young Leaders Development Programme. Just out of curiosity, has anyone been involved in the Young Leaders? One, hey, <laughs> a couple of people. Um, yeah, it's an amazing programme that runs every year and it's open to anyone from, from Scotland, across Scotland. Um, and basically this, program is completely free and um, it's an ongoing development for you to learn absolutely everything that you've ever wondered about sustainability climate change issues and um, each module that runs throughout the year has a different focus so there might be one on politics how you influence politics there might be another module on how you influence the business you work for, if that's a small cafe or a big corporate organisation, how do you influence the people within that business to care about climate change. Um, so there's a whole wealth of different modules that you can uh, learn all different elements of environmental issues and climate change. Um, we've got a new batch of young leaders coming into that later in the year. So have a look at our website which is 2050.scot and um, so you can find out more information about how you can be involved in that but that's a really amazing thing to be part of I highly recommend it um, so yeah that's 2050 group we run the young leaders development but then on top of that we also um, do quite a lot of lobbying and um, we've got a policy group who you know work on consultations and um, we've also got sort of arms coming out of the 2050 group which is just young people who want to do something so for example um, I was involved in running a zine making workshop last 
end of last year and that was just a group of young people who felt like there wasn't um, enough in the arts and culture that's speaking about climate change so they just got together and did this amazing event and um, so all those kind of things you've just got this network of people who really just care about things that you care about and you can just dip in and meet really interesting people so yeah i definitely recommend finding out more about it and if anyone would like to know more please chat to me <coughs> at the end so that's out with work but then in order to pay the bills. Um, I also work for Vegware Limited, who um, are a compostable packaging company. Anyone know that company? Yeah, lots of people. Brilliant. Yeah, that's really good. Um, so we are based in Edinburgh. We are founded by Joe Frankel, who um, was actually an academic at the University of Edinburgh. And he moved out to the States. He saw this amazing bioplastic that um, he couldn't believe was made from cornstarch. So it was a spoon in a farmer's market and he thought, there's got to be something in this. This was 10 years ago. Um, brought it back to the UK, the moulds, and started making a whole range of products that could be recycled with food after use. And, you know, as we're all learning now, much to the shock of a lot of people, which um, is quite disheartening, is that all the food packaging that we use every day from sandwich wedges to coffee cups, it's non-recyclable. So um, this whole time that we've been getting into this convenience culture and always eating on the go, all those materials have unfortunately had to go to landfill um, or incineration over this time. But we are arguing that these materials could be switched out for something that's more sustainable, um, lower carbon in the manufacture, not using virgin materials. Uh, so my role within the business is really to go out and educate people about what these materials are and um, how we recycle them correctly. Uh, so I do a lot of work with composters across the UK. I go out and spend a lot of time in wellies and going into um, composting facilities and just yeah, getting my hands dirty on that side, but then also going in and meeting our customers and really helping them um, change their recycling systems to incorporate compostable materials and food. Um, if you had said to me four or five years ago that I would be doing this job, I would have laughed because I was an uh, English literature student at the time. Um, and even though I really cared about the environment and I did a lot of volunteering out with um, my part-time job as a waitress, um, I didn't think sustainability was something that I could do. So I think my key message for everyone tonight is that you don't have to be a scientist to work in sustainability. Um, there's so many jobs out there, especially around communication. That's the key thing where we're going wrong. You know, we've got the science, but it's how do we get people to listen to that in an interesting and engaging way. So if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I don't have, you know, the qualifications to go into a science-based role, carve out something for yourself that's really um, important because there's a lot of elements that are missing so for me personally something that I think is re really missing is um, the cultural aspect, the artistic aspect of communicating climate change and environmental issues so you know if you're creative think about how can I communicate how I feel about climate change um, in a way that's going to resonate with others. The other thing that I would really emphasise, and being from the 2050 Climate Group, is volunteer. It's the best thing you can do if you want to get into a career in sustainability. Um, while saying that, I think there's a risk with a lot of young people doing unpaid work as well. So be careful because you're really a valuable asset to people. So know your worth and don't do too much for free but volunteer with really amazing charities and environmental organisations because that's the only way you're going to work out whether you even like what you think you like. Um, if you don't get in the door and see what they're doing, um, then you'll never know. So, yeah, contact companies, ask them if you can come in um, or do a bit of volunteering for charities and it's really, it really makes the world a difference. That's how I fell into this job, just through always been interested in talking to people and saying, oh, I'm interested in that, I'd love to be involved. Um, and then you just build this network organically, you didn't even know, and then suddenly it all just starts falling into place. So, 
that would be my key recommendation. That's superb. Thank you, Kate. So, uh, yeah, some really good top tips already there, and hopefully that's already prompting you for maybe questions for our panel. So start thinking about them, because we've got two more great people to hear from uh, before we go to questions. So, so next on my left here is Sandy McDonald. So Sandy uh, has got, a, again, loads of amazing things that he's done in his career already. Hopefully he'll touch on some of those when he gives his kind of five-minute summary. Key thing to note about him in terms of his current role, he's head of corporate sustainability at Standard Life Aberdeen PLC. Uh, so he's got a key role, obviously, in making sure um, that that business actually embraces sustainability, mainstreams it. Uh, but he's also uh, had roles in the FTSE for Good, the CDP, which is something in climate change that we, we look on as, a, as a, an exemplar for, for many uh, other countries in terms of um, disclosure of emissions and, and how much different businesses are emitting through their practices. Uh, other things, well, a key thing to mention for, for Sandy as well is that he used to be here. He used to be uh, one of our students studying in the School of Biological Sciences uh, and uh, clearly that didn't put you off too much, Sandy, because you're back today. So thank you and... Uh, yeah, let's hear a bit more. I am going to stand. I think it's because yes. I'm 20 years older than you. It really is starting to get to me. Um, I'm already quite envious of you because you said a lot that it's taken me 20 years to find out about communication and volunteering and things like that. And you know it now, so you're well ahead of me. Um, so I've been working for um, the same company for 20 years. Um, and I had no idea when I was sitting where you are now when I was doing biological sciences. I don't think I even knew what sustainability was, in all honesty. Um, it was probably, I've been doing this job for about five years. Um, as, uh, as was mentioned, my degree was in biology. I know I, I found, I didn't thrive at university, I'll be honest with you. So if there's anybody here at the moment who's struggling, let me give you a little bit of hope. Um, I, I had a really broad interest in a lot of things um, and I found the kind of narrowing down and getting microcellular and things I didn't really enjoy that um, I failed a module um, this room has brought back memories for me because I I failed a module and had to do a, an extra course called science and society and that was it, it provided me nothing for my uh, overall qualification and degree but it was probably the one I did best at in my entire time here and I, I really enjoyed it that kind of broader um, interest bit so um, there was a lot of things I didn't know uh, at university. I struggled with it, and I probably, in some ways, didn't do it justice. But since then, um, <laughs> since then, that's a path I've continued. No, I, um, <laughs> so first out, I went and did publishing. Um, I thought, uh, when I was at university, I found I, what I did learn about myself was the kinds of things I was good at, if not the subject, if that makes sense. So I found myself writing half my flatmates' essays for them. So I was good at that kind of thing. I was good at seminars. Um, and um, so I thought, and I, and I loved reading, actually. There was a lot of students in my flat who were doing English literature who, who got me reading things that I'd never thought about before. I would never have heard of Lanark and things like that, and I love reading them. So I went and did a postgraduate in publishing. And I worked in publishing for two years in London. And um, if you really like books and reading, there are a small number of roles in publishing that work for you. For most of the rest, um, they're basically a commodity. It's like um, somebody's written a, this manuscript. It's barely literate, but it's about ponies, and we can do a tie-in with Horse and Pony magazine and sell this many copies, and that goes out the door. And the undiscovered literary gems are really few and far between. So I found that a little bit disheartening. And also, I, I decided I wanted to be back in Edinburgh rather than London. So um, I moved back up to Edinburgh, and I got a temp job with Standard Life. Um, and my big break, if there was a big break, was I... Um, Another friend of mine, you know, by this point, some of my friends have been working um, for, for four or five years in different fields. And one of them was a marketer, and he said to me, I think you'd be really good at marketing. And, I, and, and so I studied a Chartered Institute marketing course, and, uh, and it was great. It was broad concepts, and it kind of, you can apply it in lots of different businesses. And ultimately, it's about what do companies do that meets a need for customers. When done well, I think a lot of people misunderstand marketing and think it's sales. It's, it's not. It's something different. So since then, I've done internal communications, customer communications, government relations and PR, um, and then obviously this role I'm in with corporate uh, social responsibility. The other thing I wanted to mention was a lot of the time during that, um, I had a kind of almost a parallel career volunteering. So um, I started out as a um, 
you know, having never wanted to work in financial services, that was one thing I was absolutely clear on, he says, before the 20 years that I've done um, in that industry. Um, I, uh, there's times when you do kind of think, is this what, you know, my one, you know, wild and precious life um, is, is going to be about? Um, and I'd been away on holiday in Orkney, and I came back and thought, it was that classic kind of Monday morning, I'm going back to work. Uh, um, and I applied for a trustee role with a charity called Venture Scotland. And what they do is they basically take disadvantaged uh, young people from inner cities, uh, well, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Central Boat mostly. They have a bothy in the Highlands, and they go up there and they teach them basically how to get on with each other, social skills, um, conservation, um, all these different things, how to plan and lead an expedition. They're an amazing small charity. Um, and I ended up, um, their company secretary on the board, uh, did a lot of their marketing and communications for them, those kinds of things. Um, and then, uh, as with all good governance, that came to an end. That was six years. Um, I'm now vice chair of uh, a national Scottish children's charity called Children First, because I kind of got more of an interest in earlier years in social issues. Uh, and um, I should say thank you, because Edinburgh University students have done loads to support Children First in the past few years. So if any of you have been involved, thank you for that. Um, I'm also heavily involved with living wage campaigns. If anybody's heard of the, the living wage, the real living wage, not what the cynical Westminster government uh, called the national living wage. Um, I think the key thing all the way through has been about drive and passion. You find your way. I, I had no idea about all the different jobs that existed in the workplace, but you kind of know, you know, you just be yourself and, and you talk in a particular way, you contribute in a particular way at meetings, it kind of becomes more natural. And I think people know I'm serious and credible because you talk about what you did at the weekend and you went and took a bunch of young people to a bothy in the Highlands. You didn't do something else. Um, so, advice and suggestions I was asked to share. Uh, I think the first one's probably become clearer. There are lots of right routes, lots of things you can do right. You learn as you go, uh, take what you need from each opportunity you, you bring. Your learning uh, sure as hell doesn't stop with your degree, it carries on after that. Um, your skills and your attributes and the type of person you are is at least as important in how you do in, in workplace. Um, so the kinds of things that I am good at that mean I've got this job and, and that we're doing well in all those indexes and those kinds of things is Stakeholder management and relationship, you've got to be able to build alliances either across sectors or within your business. There will be skeptics within a business going, but that will cost this. And you go, yeah, it will cost that, but you'll gain here. And you need to make that case. Um, working cross-sectorally, you need to be able to be provocative and agitate for change, but do it in such a way that, that you persuade people. You don't want to make them dig in. You know, that kind of just hurling abuse at people saying you're doing it wrong. It's ineffective. And when you talk about communication, I think a lot of activism is counterproductive because it just means people just stop listening. So um, I think that's a really important skill. And, and yeah, my science degree does help because it, you know, there's that building the evidence base. We were talking about this day that side. Um, a final thought in terms of if you are, if you have that clarity I didn't have already and you know you want to go and work in sustainability, whether it's social or environmental, um, there aren't actually that many clear sustainability roles relative to some other professions. Um, and roles like mine um, are only really in big companies. So, but the opportunity is much, much bigger than that in terms of how you can incorporate ESG and sustainability into a whole bunch of things. So you can be in a customer-facing role and think about how do we make this more inclusive? How do we make our product more sustainable? Um, you can work in procurement and have an influence on your supply chain. You can work in HR and think about how you help people from different backgrounds into your workplace or how you lead in in the way that decent work is provided or work-life balance and things like that. Um, and finance, obviously, in terms of investment, sustainability and inclusion. The other opportunity you all have, which didn't exist, is this whole change in company structures now. So, so things like Vegware and Social Bite and Social Enterprises and B Corps, there's this whole growth of small businesses that are just operating in a fundamentally different way. So it doesn't need to be you know, you go out and you go, I'm going to find a role that exists in a company, you know, you can, you can be that company, you know, in a, in a way. Um, and then the final thing um, I wanted to say was um, your behaviour as a citizen and a, a consumer um, does make a difference as well, I think. So, um, you know, when you join your workplace pension scheme, which is now kind of compulsory after you get to a certain age in the UK, uh, ask people where it's invested, make sure it's in the right kinds of companies and build more roles of, of the type that you want to be in. Um, have a go at companies on Twitter who do use plastic indiscriminately because it helps investors then turn around and, 
and, and have a bigger influence. Um, and that's, I'm going to leave it there. That that's time. wonderful. Thank okay. you, Sonny. Okay, so uh, our final panellist uh, is another great one. So we've got, you've got four uh, incredible people. So start thinking about those questions because this is a brilliant opportunity for you. So Rebecca, Rebecca Petford is also an alum of the university. So she actually did a master's in my school in geosciences. So her master's was in environment, culture and society, uh, but also uh, has a degree in sustainable development. And Rebecca manages a thing called the, uh, so I'm trying to remember what the acronym stands for. So it's the EAUC, which is... Environmental Association for Universities and Colleges. Fantastic. So I should know this because uh, Rebecca's been involved with some really, uh, I've been hugely impressed by the events that you've run within uh, the university, bringing lots of people in, but obviously it's an organisation uh, which goes much uh, more wide than that, so across Scotland but across the UK. Um, and as part of that, looking at how we embed sustainability not just in things like, um, you know, are we environmentally sustainable in terms of our, say, procurement or our supply chains, but how do we embed sustainability into an organi organisation like the university, for instance, in terms of our teaching? What's sustainable teaching? What are our, our kind of, if we're doing a degree on, what would it, might it be? Say veterinary science, where you've got a really kind of packed schedule, you've got very much a controlled um, progression through the years. How can sustainability fit with those different disciplines and those outcomes so that uh, actually this cross-cutting issue, which is sustainability, isn't just something which sits in geosciences or sits in the business school? So part of Rebecca's um, organisation and work helps us understand how we can do that. So thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, and actually, the vet school are doing some amazing work here, so mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a very good yeah. example. Um, so when I left school, I thought I was going to be an engineer and I went and started an engineering degree and about six months in, um, it was like Christmas period and I was like, I hate this, absolutely, this is not what I want to do. So um, luckily my parents didn't disown me and they agreed that I could drop out. Um, uh, but the only thing that I knew that I'd really enjoyed out of that course, which had been architectural engineering, had actually been um, environmental aspects of it. So I realised at that point having done geography at school and stuff, but not really engaged with it much, that I'd really been interested in finding out more about that. So I took some time out, so I was uh, sort of working in a nursery, a children's nursery, and also for some children's theatre companies for a year and a half, just getting different skills. Um, and at the end of that point, I went to St Andrews, and I did an undergraduate in sustainable development. And I really enjoyed it, uh, but I was very academically involved in that for at least the first three years. And what I mean by that is I turned up to the classes, I did fine, like I was, did all the assessments and everything, and um, I was on course to do well, but I wasn't really getting involved. Like I, my, I was academically doing it, but not actually engaged with it, with my heart and soul or whatever you want to say. Um, so basically the summer of, at the end of third year, beginning of fourth year, I sort of thought to myself, well, I could really just like really push to definitely get a first or I could spend this year and have a bit more fun and get a bit more involved and actually get some skills that would be useful. And so I used my fourth year both to finish my degree, but also to um, get a bit more involved in the community of St Andrews. So during that year, I and a group of other people started up Transition University of St Andrews through a society there. So um, that's basically a community organisation which encourages the university to be more sustainable in how we live as well as like how we're running the institution. Um, St Andrews was already pretty good in how they run it, but that took it a bit further and took it into being the community's responsibility rather than just the estate team's responsibility. Um, and I also helped start something called St Andrews, which is a, a, a hand-on uh, reuse network for uh, student belongings at the end of the year to the next group of students, which there's something very similar to here at Edinburgh. Um, and I basically at that point got the bug for making things happen, for project work and seeing like starting something and then seeing the outcome at the end of it. Um, so when I graduated, I knew that was something that I really wanted to do. And actually, Transition University of St Andrews got funding from the Climate Challenge Fund, uh, which meant that there was jobs there. And so I ended up uh, working with them for nine months to be one of the first set of project officers there that actually got more projects started. And actually, that project, Transition University of St Andrews, is still going on. So it's great that something that I was involved with when I was a student is now still getting funding and still continuing. Um, after that point, I was, you know, had another moment of what should I do next. So that's when I came here to St Andrews, no, to Edinburgh, sorry, and did my MSc in Environment, Culture and Society, which uh, was really good and just gave me a different perspective. So uh, St Andrews had been a bit more 
um, practical, whereas my, the course here at Edinburgh was a bit more ethics-based and that kind of thing. Um, and then, again, you're out into the workplace and trying to find jobs. So um, I did a few part-time jobs back again for the transition uh, in St Andrews, but also a reuse organisation, sorry, a re creative use organisation for taking empty town centre spaces in Kirkcaldy, which was near where I live, and transforming them to something useful. So we had a Christmas market, for example, with local creative people. Um, and when I was doing those two jobs, I knew that I wanted a full-time job, but I was just looking out for the right one. And a job came up at the EAUC, which is the Environmental Association for Universities and Colleges, uh, who support all the universities well. So we're a membership organisation across the UK, and, and universities and colleges sign up and basically get um, support to develop their environmental sustainability and social sustainability uh, teaching, but also how they run their estate. In Scotland, we work with every university and college uh, because the Scottish government is very behind it and we get funding from the Scottish Funding Council. Um, so I started off as a, the project coordinator with the AUC and two years ago, or a year and a half ago now, I became the programme manager. And so my day-to-day -day job involves a lot of like developing relationships, deciding what way the programme's going to go, looking at new project ideas. So we're doing a lot about um, sustainability in the curriculum at the moment because that's a really interesting topic. Um, and still some project work, which is great because I really do like that. Um, I would say that the key turning points in my life so far, my career so far, and it's not been that long really, um, have been, first of all, when I went, I'm doing the wrong thing and I'm going to stop and I'm going to make a decision. Um, and it was a very difficult decision to make, but I'm very pleased I did because I don't think I would ever have been here had I not at that point rethought everything. Um, and the second key turning point was getting involved in practical projects. It was a lot of fun. It made my fourth year at uni so much better than it would have been if I'd just been like studying and doing like the odd thing on the side with friends. Um, but it also got me a lot of skills, and that allowed me to get at you know when you go into a job um, interview or an application stage. I've got so many things that I can talk about that you know I did social media for an event, or I organised something, or I did some public speaking, and I can prove that. And uh, it's really good to have that wide range of experiences. So that would be one of my key pieces of advice for you all is get involved. Um, for my first three years at uni, I was on loads of mailing lists and I attended loads of events, but I didn't actually do anything. Like I didn't make anything happen. You need to make something happen if you want to talk about it. So yes, get involved and make something happen. The second thing I'd say is, uh, although I do have a degree in sustainability, uh, what I've found is I, I've got two colleagues with me in the EAUC Scotland office. Neither of them have a degree or academic background in sustainability, and they're both brilliant at what they do. They have an absolute passion for it, and they have the skills that they need to do their job. So there are both technical and also transferable skills that you will need to work in sustainability. Um, and it depend, the technical skills will depend on what you're going to do. But there's so many transferable skills out there, and there are things like organising events and being able to communicate well and that kind of thing that really will help you. And they're the sort of things that you can be building up while you're at university. Um, another thing I'd say is that sustainability jobs or jobs in sustainability, we lump them all together, but it can mean a very wide variety of things. So you might choose to have a job in sustainability because you really care about sustainability, or you might choose because you've done a course in it and you've got skills in it or a bit of both, and either is totally fine. You also might see sustainability as a core focus of your job, or just a small aspect of it. So um, you might be sitting on a sustainability committee as a very small aspect of your job, but you're still doing a little bit for sustainability, and that obviously they're both jobs in sustainability, just to a uh, lesser or bigger extent. And also sustainability can be the mission of an organization. So for example, Vegware, sustainability is core to what that uh, organization does. So any role within that could sort of be seen as a sustainability job. Whereas if you were working for Standard Life, not every job there could be seen as a sustainability role. So some organizations, you could do whatever your background is in working with them and be working in sustainability. And then the final thing I'd say is that uh, I'm just going to do a little plug. So EAUC developed some careers resources on careers and sustainability, which goes through this in a little bit more detail. It looks like this. Um, and it's linked to on the careers website, I think. Eco Week website, yeah. Um, so please do have a look if you're interested. There's also some webinars if you prefer to learn by watching. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Rebecca. So I told you, a great panel. And one of the things Rebecca said there, one of her brilliant top tips was 
um, to do something about it. So not always take the, the route which is I'm just going to do my studies and just do stuff with my friends. And you're already doing that because you're here tonight. You're doing something which is a proactive kind of I'm going to find out more about careers and sustainability. So you're already on that, that pathway. As part of that, hopefully you looked at some of the stalls uh, uh, downstairs. If you haven't had a chance to speak to people there, they're going to be um, open after the event as well. So we're going to finish uh, in, a, in uh, 10, 15 minutes or so. So do go back down there and have a chat with them. But now is a chance to, um, to ask those burning questions or just kind of uh, insights which you've heard from our four panellists where you just want to hear a bit more from. We've got roving mics, so Rachel and Matt have got the, the roving mics. So if you've got a question, then I know it's horrible, but do stick your hands up and, and ask anything to our panel. So we've got one here, first of all. So if you can pass the mic along, Rachel. Uh, this is a question. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, this is a question for Kate. Um, you said you did an English Lit degree as your background and then went into working at Vegware and something which seems very practical in a way in terms of you're out getting your feet dirty. Um, could you talk a bit more about the process of going from that degree background into practical sustainability? Because I have a philosophy background. It's a bit similar to English Lit in a way. And I was wondering, yeah, how, how you transition over to something much more practical. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I think it comes back to voluntary work. Um, because when I was studying English literature, I was very theory-based and I thought, oh, I'm definitely going to do this for the rest of my life. I love this kind of thing. And, um, you know, in my final year at uni, I was writing about eco-feminism, um, which, for anyone who doesn't know, is the theory about how um, the environment and nature is sort of introduced into fiction. So that was definitely going to get me a job, not. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was really passionate about the theory side, but then on the side, I was doing a lot of practical things through voluntary work. Um, so I was, you know, I was involved with 2050 Group. Um, I was involved with a group at Glasgow University called Guest, who are an um, environment and sustainability team. So they would have projects where they would say do you want to go and do that and I would go out like as Rebecca was saying you were just kind of thrown into something you were doing an event suddenly because someone else couldn't do it and you were just there and so you were getting these skills that you would never have thought you could do beforehand and um, the other amazing turning point for me which I should have mentioned which was a lot earlier was when I came out of school I had no idea what I wanted to do um, just kind of floating about and then there was an opportunity with um, the Scottish Government EDGE programme which is still running um, but this was about nearly uh, nine years ago now um, but they had an opportunity where you could work within a business and the business that I ended up work working with was a composting business and um, so from that I started thinking about like what is compost I've never even thought about this before what happens to food what is all this stuff um, and then that led me to think about business ideas with waste and I ended up going doing a project that won a prize at the end of this thing with the Scottish government which again I would never have seen myself doing earlier in, in my life so these kind of things you just need to throw yourself in and say like ask questions as well like how does this work you know, within businesses or within charities. Um, yeah, so that was kind of the theory side for yourself. You know, you're doing uh, your degree and you're loving the theory, but then out with that, what are you doing to get practical skills or, you know, be involved in different things? That's a brilliant answer, Kate. It just so Winter Olympics are just coming up, and uh, I'm a great one for, for kind of, I guess, great sayings to irritate my kids with. But there's a Winter Olympian who, at the last Winter Olympics, she was being interviewed and they're saying, just, you know, how, how do you do this? How do you always win? And she just had this phrase, which was, effort never betrays you. And it just, you know, it kind of sums up uh, what Kate was saying there, that actually putting yourself out there, it always pays you back, even if it kind of doesn't pan out in the way you're expecting. Uh, it never betrays you, that effort. We've got a question at the front here, Matt or Rachel, whoever's... That's coming. Uh, 
Hi. So my question is about: um, Did you more like it's kind of for all of you? Did you f more find and search for job, or did you fi find out that it was more about opportunities and networking? He wants to take that one. What, what work do you mind? Mm. I suspect you'll get different answers from different people, yeah. but yeah. Um, so. I knew about this job, I would say, about five or ten years before I thought I, mean, I can get that job. But it's, it's the job that runs it at my company. So there are seven or eight jobs in the team. Um, and there would have been different routes. I could have gone in a junior route and tried to work up, or I could take a parallel route. There was different opportunities. I, I thought during all of that time that I could do it better than the people that were doing it, I'll be honest. <laughs> um, so I was, th in a way, you're thinking in your head how you would do certain things. Um, and, I, and it maybe links to the previous question as well. The stuff that you talk about in an interview most of the time isn't about, isn't about an academic thing. It's about the way you, as an individual, go about doing something. So the way in which I then persuaded them that I was the right person to do it was um, I can demonstrate I'm good at building a strong team. Um, I've turned around underperforming teams before. Uh, I brought experience from my volunteering bit, but also from different bits of work and, and across audiences. So. I think um, I had done a bit of research. Um, I'd had different points where I'd thought is the right step for me to go and do full-on public policy and leave this company and go somewhere else, or is it, is it that? And um, I don't know, there's, there occasionally there's the odd sweet moment where it all just kind of comes together and you nail an interview. Um, and, and I guess and, and from that respect, there's always a little bit of luck, but research is never wasted, a bit like effort. You know? <laughs> research never betrays you, <laughs> brilliant. So, um, yeah, Rebecca, if you... I'd say that they kind of fall together as well. So um, when you build your network, you then hear about more jobs. So it's not necessarily that people are coming to you to say, do you want this job? Or, you know, are you interested in this job? It's much more that you start to become aware of the different places that you would find interesting jobs. So you might not be looking, but you'll suddenly come across a very interesting position that you want to find out a bit more about. Um, and it's a lot easier because you've got that network, so you often know somebody who may know somebody or who works in that company, and so you can find out a little bit more before you apply about whether that is actually something that you want. So it's a bit of both. You've got to keep your eye on the job market formally, but then you've also got to be aware of like the bigger the network you've got, the more chance you've got of really understanding what the jobs are out there and seeing things in the first place. Do you mind if I add something quickly? Yes. Just, I should say as an employer as well, so I've got seven or eight people in my team. Some of them are people I met in a meeting and thought, you're good, I like you. And then when a job came up, I went and asked them if they were interested. So there is, a, you know, they had to get in front of me. And so there is a networking element from that point of view. Other times I was looking for particular skills. So I, as an employer, I'm looking at both things as well. Great. We have a question at the top there. Oh, you've got your mic, Will. Go ahead. I just wanted to know about the biggest pushback any of you had overcome and what the pushback was and how you overcame it. So I'm going to go to you first, Stuart. Uh, what's the biggest pushback? Oh, had I've had a number, I suppose. Um, trying to pick one out. Uh, actually, do you mind if I think about that and I'll okay. come back to that in, 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 in a moment or two? A horrible yeah. thing they want to share with us about, <laughs> yeah. about pushbacks and barriers. <laughs> My whole job is pushbacks. People <laughs> never listen to what I say. Um, no, but you know, it's it get used to people saying no to you, um, especially in sustainability. Like a lot of the time, I, I'm sure in this room, some of you have got ideas that are totally insane and seem really wacky, but would probably be amazing. Would contribute something brilliant to um, climate change, solving climate change issues. Um, but you're going to get laughed at probably and people are going to say it's not going to work but keep going like if you believe that you can do something positive and it's going to make a difference then yeah get ready for people to say no and I think someone said earlier about when you go especially into um, private business you realise that it's it is all about money at the end of the day and it's about budgets um, and sometimes people will just cut you off and say absolutely not like it's too expensive but keep on at people because things change you know in the last year there's people who shut the door in my face and now want to speak to me because David Attenborough said that they should <laughs> um, so these kinds of things like just keep just be relentless and don't 
be afraid to embarrass yourself as well. I'm going to tell a really embarrassing quick Go story. So in my interview um, with the owner of Vegware, I got into a massive discussion about menstrual cups and menstruation. And I walked out and I was like, did, I, did that just happen? What <laughs> is wrong with me? And then I got the job. So it was very weird, it but it worked. <laughs> Uh, yes, Rebecca. Um, I guess where I work, it's about funding a lot of the time, um, and quite a few of the different roles I've had, it's been reliant on funding from somebody. Um, the Climate Challenge Fund is a massive fund that funds a lot of sustainability stuff that goes on in Scotland, but you can be involved in a project one year and then it doesn't get funding the next year, and so I've had that happen. Um, we've also... I guess we're in EAUC Scotland, we're funded by the Scottish Funding Council. Sometimes they turn around and say, ah, we don't really like your project, you'll need to like make some changes and then maybe we'll fund it. So I think that's been a hard thing to deal with, is that you might think that you've got a brilliant project that is exactly what is needed, but you need to find something that a funder wants to pay for.